Even in the 1950s, people were dreaming about having a phone in their car. And it, you know, some of it looked a little bit like this. And then the first cell phone uh, kind of looked a little bit like this. Remember this? Well, there he is, Martin Cooper. And I got a chance to, to get Martin Cooper to sit down and talk about that first cell phone call he made in 1973. Today, there are over six and a half billion cell phones in the world. And I know if you're like me, you wouldn't leave the house without one. It's indispensable. And yet, only 40 years ago last month, the very first cell phone call was made by my guest, Marty Cooper. Welcome to the program. Nice to be here. So what was it like? What was going through your mind when you made that first cell phone call? Well, the very first thing, Roger, was I hope this stamp thing works. <laughs> I bet. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, the real reason for doing that phone call was we were trying to get attention to, uh, we were just a little company in, in Chicago, and uh, AT&T, which was the biggest company in the world, had announced they had invented a thing called cellular telephony. Uh, and they had only two conditions. One is they wanted a monopoly, which would sure. probably have put us out of business. And the second thing is that they wanted to have car telephones. If you could imagine, uh, we had been trapped for a hundred years in our homes and in our offices by that copper wire. Now we were gonna be trapped in our cars. Yep. So we were trying to get attention and uh, it worked. What company were you working for then? That was Motorola. Motorola, yeah. as a small company. Well, it was then. Well, it was around a billion dollars, but AT&T was uh, twenty-two billion. Yeah, exactly. All right, so you were there on the street. That's right. In uh, Manhattan, with, with a journalist, right? With a journalist, and you. And you, is this the phone you picked up? This one right here. It was uh, identical to this. This is a model that is made exactly like it. it weighs two and a half pounds, so you can see what the size is. Actually, the phone that we conceived of, that we designed, was this big. But uh, by the time we put all the parts inside, that's what we ended <laughs> up with. You had to at that time because of the technology. That's exactly right. Now, again, when you made that call, who did you call, first of all? And this is a funny story. Well, uh, I had to call somebody, and I decided I'd call my competitor, the guy who was running the AT&T program, a guy named uh, Dr. Joel Engel, very bright guy. Uh, and I called him, and I said, uh, Joel, I'm calling you on a cell phone, but a real cell phone, a personal, handheld, portable cell phone. Silence at the other, Silence. End, of the, at the, other end of the line. But he, he was very polite. Uh, and to this day, uh, Joel does not remember that phone call, and I guess I don't blame him. <laughs> now, what was different between what at t was proposing and what you were holding in your hand? Well, it was just that, that, that we believe that people are fundamentally mobile. You know, they, if you look around uh, at the freeways, everybody's going somewhere else. Nobody's where they want to be. And so the idea of, of continuing this copper wire leash just didn't make sense to us. And, and that was the real stimulus. We thought the world was ready for personal communications. Now, talk about the technology that had to go into that, though, because it was a leap to get rid of that leash. What, in your mind, were the components that had to be, you know, the inventiveness that had to be brought together? I mean, every invention is a collection of previous inventions, I suppose. You're right. What, what, uh, what previous inventions were necessary for you to get this? Well, first of all, nobody had ever operated at a frequency as high as that. We were operating at 1,000 megahertz. The highest we'd ever had before was 450, and even that was new. So we needed new devices for that. You know, most radios at that time, the radio that you used for uh, your marine channel, you yeah, may have had- ship to shore radio. Ship to shore. You may have had uh, three or four channels, if, if, right. I, if I recall. We needed to put 666 channels into this. So we needed a, a new concept called a integrated circuit, which was brand new at that time. And we had to have an integrated circuit with very low current drain. So that was a challenge. Now, even the antenna, nobody had built a thousand megahertz portable antenna before. So there were many, many devices and squeezing all of that stuff, discrete parts. We use things like coils and capacitors. Young engineers don't even know what those are today. No, they certainly don't. How interesting. So 
you pulled this all together, but I'm sure you had a team of people oh, that yes, worked on yes. this. Oh, yes, Some really smart engineers, both the people that put the, uh, uh, all this stuff together uh, in this device. That took a team of, of uh, over half a dozen people. And then we have to build all the stations that uh, went around it. And then other people have to install those things uh, in both New York uh, and in Washington. I was next going to ask you about that because cell phones don't work without cells, without the idea that there's a repeating uh, kind of a, a series of antennas, right? Exactly. And at that time, no such thing existed. That's right. We actually had to build the cell sites. Uh, and in fact, the one in New York is still there. The, the union wanted so much money to take this station down, we just left it there. And, and every few years, I go back and visit our, our <laughs> first cell site. No kidding. The first cell site is still there. It is. Motorola went ahead and took a chance that you were right, that people were mobile and people did want this device. What happened next? Uh, well, uh, the first thing that happened is the FCC, which is the uh, government agency that we were trying to influence, they did make the right decision. Yeah. They decided, they first of all, it was going to be competitive, and they decided to let the industry decide <clears throat> about this issue of portability, and of course, the right thing happened. Uh, we, they allowed low power, which meant that you could have uh, portables. So now, since we had achieved the policy judgments, we had to build a thing. Yes. Uh, and over the next 10 years, they actually were four iterations, four new versions of this phone, uh, as well as new technology everywhere. Uh, and it took 10 years before the phone was ready and before the FCC decided who was gonna be the carrier. Well, so, the, rest, the rest of the story is you and I carrying around things like this <laughs> in yes, our hands. That's right. Uh, and, I, and I just want to thank you on behalf of the six and a half billion uh, phone users now, because of you and your team, uh, it made it possible for us to be able to do the things we do today with these remarkable devices. Thanks for being here, Martin. Oh, it's my great pleasure. It's a pleasure, thanks. Martin Cooper, it's like talking to Alexander Graham Bell. Unbelievable.